Join Edwin Frondozo on the Business Leadership Podcast every week for a unique program featuring insights and actionable items from the world's most successful business leaders. Hear firsthand the exclusive interviews and personal journeys on how today's transformational leaders made it to the top. A business leader or a leader needs to needs to be passionate and empathetic and, and run their business mm-hmm. with honesty and integrity and needs commitment to the staff and the process. But if there's one thing, actually, let's say two things that I think are really important is having good communicate, good communication and decision making skills. And the other is the ability to understand risk and take appropriate risk where possible. And if you possess both of those things, you probably do really well. <music> This is the Business Leadership Podcast, and I'm your host, Edwin Frondozo. Thank you for joining me today. I trust you're having a fine and productive day. My guest is Jeff Wiener, an entrepreneur, real estate investor, board member, founder of multiple companies, author, and the CEO of The Kick-Ass Entrepreneur. Jeff is an accomplished business owner who sold the majority share of his 50 employee business in 2017. And in 2018, Jeff published a book called The Kick Ass Entrepreneur's Guide to Investing Three Simple Steps to Creating Massive Wealth with Your Business Profits. The book was number one in both the business and nonfiction sections for three weeks during the summer of 2018. And to date, he sold over 40,000 copies. Now semi-retired, Jeff spends the majority of his time helping entrepreneurs build their business, improve profits, and ultimately create wealth. In our conversation, Jeff shares one of his biggest challenges that maybe many business owners, sometimes they call themselves the best salespersons of the organizations, that they have to overcome by letting go of the sales leads and delegating them to their members. Jeff talks about the Peter Principle and how he was able to break through it to move up to the next level for his business and as a business leader. We talk about the reason why he sold his business and what got him started with the Kick-Ass Entrepreneur's Guide to Investing. Today's episode is brought to you by Slingshot, a leader in business VoIP solutions that empowers the emerging business leader to focus on their core competencies while ensuring their communications infrastructure is aligned with their vision of the future. Slingshot, VoIP solutions that understand the needs of the emerging business leaders. With that, here we go. Welcome to the Business Leadership Podcast, Jeff. Hi, Edwin. How are you doing today? Oh, man, I'm pretty good. Pretty, pretty, I don't like to say the word busy. Uh, my, My life is full right now. And I think I mentioned before we started recording, I'm off to... Berlin to run the Berlin Marathon, Jeff. So I guess when people are listening to this, hopefully, God willing, I finished it. <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. well, and how long are you gone for? I'm gone for just five days, actually, because my wife and my daughter are staying home. So uh, I'm going to try to enjoy my time there and just focus on uh, seeing the sights as I run it. <laughs> and, Sounds exciting. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. If you can, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm really excited to have you um, in terms of all the experience you have, but for the benefit of our listeners today, can you introduce yourself to, to them, let them know who you are and maybe what you like to do outside of growing, managing, leading businesses? Sure. Okay. So I'll try and keep this relatively short. My name is Jeff Wiener. Um, I started my first business in 1991. Actually, I st- even before that, I, I started a few businesses while I was in high school. Uh, I started my real formal business in 1991. And I say formal is because that's the business that I ended up running for close to 27 years. And mm-hmm. I started that business out of the basement of really an apartment building. Um, and, and I grew that business to approximately a little over 50 people inside of 27 years. And I sold as a telecom company and I sold that to private equity in 2017. 
and and at the end of that uh, had to come to a decision in terms of what I wanted to do with my life post business sale. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't sell because I needed the money. I I sold because I didn't like what I was doing any longer. Uh, I I was um, I pretty much accomplished all that I'd wanted to accomplish in running that business, and any future challenge that I saw wasn't anything that I was overly interested in doing, whether it had to do with marketing or leadership or b- building the business and doubling the business again, because I'd done that many times over. It was a, a well into an eight-figure business, and I, I didn't really – the next challenge just wasn't there for me. So mm-hmm. I'll give you a 30-second background to how I came yeah. to that decision to sell was – um, my wife's best friend was diagnosed with um, terminal brain cancer in 2016, and and she and her husband were the couple that we were going to to essentially semi-retire with and travel the world with. And and uh, her name's Joanne, and, and Joanne unfortunately passed away in early 2017. But in and around that time frame, I came to realize that running a business wasn't something that I wanted to do any longer. As a result of Joanne's illness, I sort of self-reflected on whether or not I was headed in the right direction and came to the realization that if something had happened to me uh, and and I was faced with the same situation, would I be happy with where I was at in my life? And the answer was no. So I put my business on the market. I worked with Ernst & Young or E&Y as an M&A advisor. And and, um, within 10 months, uh, my business had sold. So since selling, I wrote a book, actually did very well uh, and and could talk about that in a minute. But uh, it was launched on Amazon and it ended up being the number one book um, in, in both business and nonfiction and sold over 40,000 copies. So that, that sort of kept me busy for a bit. I'm now semi-retired and my goal is to spend more time with my kids who are both in university, with my wife, travel the world. We've got we've done all sorts of traveling so far and we've got more to go. And I've also launched a blog, which is sort of my own version of a new small business that I'm creating because it's going to be eventually become a blog network of a number of business blogs that I'm, that I'm sort of creating. But it's something that I can do from anywhere. And it's also a passion of mine, which is writing. So that's a bit of a background on me and how I came to be where I am now. Wow. Well, thank you for for the quick intro and synopsis of of Jeff. So that, that that's really great. And there's so much nuggets of that I'd love to, you know, really dive into in terms of your past and hopefully we get to talk about some of them because for the listeners out there, which may be interesting, Jeff, is the fact that you are able to grow and scale a business. A, from the entrepreneur point, and as I'm sure through the journey, um, learning how to manage and lead companies, people, culture as well. Um, But before we get to there, I wanted to actually talk about your book. I know it's something you launched a little bit over a year ago. It's called The Kick-Ass Entrepreneur. Can you, I guess, tell us what it is and and really why you wrote it? Sure. So... Um, if it was a personal challenge, first of all, actually, I'll tell you the name of the book, The Kick-Ass Entrepreneur's Guide to Investing, Three Simple Steps to Create Massive Wealth with Your Business's Profits. So I wrote the book. It was actually a personal challenge of mine. I'd always wanted to write a book. And I wrote a book geared toward IT about seven, eight years ago, but it, it didn't really satisfy the writing challenge for me. So I, I picked up the exercise of trying to figure out, can I write a book? Can I actually do well with it? And I did. But really, it's a topic that I was very passionate about, which is entrepreneurship and investing. So, mm-hmm. the, and, and I'll tell you very briefly, um, uh, the nature of the book is it, it's geared toward entrepreneurs and really from my perspective, I spent years trying to understand asset allocation. I ran a very profitable business. We made very good profits. But at the end of the day, I didn't understand how to invest those profits. And so let's fast, let's rewind back to 1999 prior to, um, the, the stock market mini crash in the tech sector in 2000. Mm-hmm. I was fully 100% invested into the tech sector. I felt I knew the tech sector. I was passionate about it. And I bought all sorts of tech stocks at the time, some of which did very well 20 years later and some of which ended up going bankrupt companies like Nortel. So my portfolio, which was probably about, I'm not going to necessarily give you a number. It was a, it was a mid-sized six-figure portfolio. I lost about 
percent of that, that the value wow. of that. And in and around the same time, I'd started a software company while I was running my other division or my other business. And that company uh, ended up getting into some financial difficulties, and it was almost about to suck out um, or, or bring down uh, the, the, my main business. And what I found at the time was that I was in a very precarious situation. The stock market had had essentially crashed in the tech sector. I lost a lot of money there, and, and it was really paper losses, but I lost my, a lot of value there. And by the same token, I needed the cash to support my business, and I didn't even I didn't have the cash to do what I needed to do to bring up my other business. So I became uh, quite intrigued by the idea of how does an entrepreneur invest, and I ended up speaking to a number of financial advisors to tell them and explain my dilemma. And this is in 2001, mm-hmm. 2002, and I didn't find what I was looking for. So I came up with my own asset allocation mix. And admittedly, it wasn't something that I developed or designed myself. It's actually a 2,000-year-old asset allocation strategy. Um, it's, it's actually from the Bible. And it says, invest a third of your assets into cash, a third into real estate, and a third into equities. And the third of the equity value was essentially my business. So I ended up investing a third of my other wealth into real estate and the other third into cash. And really, the purpose behind the book is to demonstrate how I did what I did, um, how I ended up getting over 30% compounded year-over-year return on my investment over 27 years, and try and help other entrepreneurs who are in a similar dilemma, making good profits, don't understand asset allocation or how to invest profits, speak to financial advisor. The financial advisor inv- invariably will ask, how old are you? They'll say, I'm 40 years old. I've got a million dollars or $100,000, whatever the number is to invest. They'll say, okay, you should be invested 40% stocks and 60% um, bonds, for example. And lo and behold, um, your asset allocation is in this at the end of the day in a similar situation that I was in in 1999. So yeah. really, I just want to stop right there. To help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. And I just want to, for the purpose, and maybe myself and some of the listeners out there who are starting and growing um, a profitable business now. So the advisors, from what I'm hearing from you, these these financial advisors were not made to advise entrepreneurs that may have this equity allocation already where the sense that, you know, this equity and your cash and your money is actually coming from the same part. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Right. And, and I guess where you were going to and what you, I mean, they just didn't make sense what they were saying. It it didn't. So if you talk to most financial advisors, they don't understand entrepreneurship. They don't understand how a business owner is different. Typically, they don't understand how a business owner is different from a regular investor who, let's say, has a full-time job. They don't own a business and they don't have any risk associated with business ownership. So I I spoke to a whole lot of people and no one got it. And even after, so that was in the early 2000s, even into the later days, like I sold my business. So sell my business. I've got a whole lot of cash now and I try to figure out how to invest it, I probably spoke to about six to eight different financial advisors. Not a single one actually understood or asked me the right questions that made me comfortable that they knew um, that, that an entrepreneur needed to invest any differently than a regular investor. So, that's so, that's no, so interesting. I, I, I struggled with it. Yeah. I mean, it almost makes me wonder, Jeff, if you outside of financial advisors, uh, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs sit with entrepreneur circles as advisors. Do you ever have, have you had, a, had those conversations with other entrepreneurs that had, were in the similar, similar situation and maybe they just had to figure out their own wealth strategy? So I belong to a peer CEO group. Um, there's about a hundred CEOs. They're all tech tech sector based CEOs, and some of them have done extremely well in their financial careers and and and, have, um, and, and grown their businesses tremendously and have got a lot of profits to invest. And I'll tell you, they all struggle with the same thing. Um, I and you know, as, as, as good as most of these these entrepreneurs are business owners are they don't necessarily understand how to invest stocks and in, in stock market etc or bonds or or asset allocation or, or correlation in, in inside of an investment portfolio so i realize this is clearly off topic from a leadership podcast but yes the answer is i see this 
all the time. And in fact, I'm having lunch tomorrow with a very good friend who sold his business as well. And, and I'm talking the, the very high eight figures. And he asked me out for lunch because he wants to pick my brain on asset allocation and investment and investing because he's struggling with the same thing, doesn't understand um, asset allocation. He's talked to many advisors. They just, none of them seem to really get it. So he needs to take better ownership of that and try and figure it out for himself. No, yeah, no, for sure, and I and I really appreciate the insight. As uh, I don't think it's far from the topics that that are important to people who listen to this podcast. And like I said, maybe it's a little for myself, right, Jeff? I get this one on one with you <laughs> and get some insight in terms of what you've learned from. And, and my last comment on that, and maybe looking at how you develop your own strategy. I love it that you're using a two thousand year old strategy, but uh, there must be a place for these financial advisors now. So if you did create this um, way that you break things down and maybe 30% of them are, or 15% is to be on the, on the open market, that's when you would maybe um, engage with some of these folks, right? Um, so, so your question is when, when would a business owner or entrepreneur want to engage with a financial advisor? Yeah. Like after creating this high level, I guess, strategy where you have 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. So if you went to an advisor, so the, the the only time I would ever say so as an entrepreneur, I wouldn't call it an investment advisor under no circumstances. I do it myself. And and really my book, and, and this isn't a pitch to try and sell my book because it's now available for free. So I don't get anything if you download it off of Amazon. But um, it, it, uh, under no circumstances would I say that an entrepreneur should ever work with a, a, a financial advisor. Do it yourself. Um, I laid it out. It's really easy to follow. And uh, it, I, I've designed the portfolio that I have and the way I, I, I've kind of drafted it, um, it is it will protect your assets in the event of a recession or, or if, if um, whatever hits the market and, and the equity markets go down in a major way, you'll sort of be protected from that. And, and I've shielded the entrepreneur in that respect. And I'm not, you know, th there may be an occasion where you might want to call an advisor if you've got too much cash, for example, and you're now outside of the one third, one third, one third allocation, and you want to allocate a small portion to equities, sure, go call a financial advisor in that case. Or for that matter, why don't you just buy an ETF or a mutual fund? But I mean, that, that's it kind of, and, and look clearly if, if this was a, a podcast geared toward um, uh, investments and allocation, I can probably go and do a much deeper dive into uh, um, beta and correlation, correlation coefficients in terms of uh, how do markets sort of trade between bonds and stocks. And, but it, it's clearly outside the scope of, of um, uh, a leadership podcast per se. Yeah. No, no, but it, it's definitely interesting. I appreciate that. So, yeah, I mean, with that in mind, Jeff, and you mentioned you know, growing and scaling your businesses, leading your business that you just recently exited from. I think you mentioned about 50 employees over 27 years. And for those, whether they're the entrepreneur, the founder, or, you know, a C-level executive, I can only imagine you went through many learning, let's call it learning opportunities uh, or challenges. Um, I'd love it if you could share, maybe pinpoint a key difficult situation, maybe it was a decision that you had to make that was maybe earlier on in your career um, that allowed you to significantly grow um, as a leader. So there was a situation back in 2013. You know, every business grows to a point where I think the business owner reaches, let's call it a glass ceiling. And unless you understand how to pass that glass ceiling, your business will effectively stay stagnant and, and not really grow past that glass ceiling. Um, there, there's a concept called Peter Principle. And so if, if you haven't heard of it, it's sort of a bit of a leadership um, concept, concept or, or term. Uh, the Peter Principle is, is a uh, concept that was developed by a management guru, if you will. He wrote a book on this. And the, the point of it is, is that people grow to their point of incompetence. And once you reach your point of incompetence, it's very difficult to get past that point unless you make a pivot of some sort. So I came to that point in 2013, I believe it was, where 
my business had my, my revenues had been fairly stagnant for quite a while and and we were growing but not at the pace that I would like to have seen the business grow and one of my favorite employees uh, who, who I thought really liked working under me and for our business handed in his letter of reg- resignation and it came as a huge shock because I thought that this guy really liked working under me. And there was nothing, no holds barred. I sort of said to him, look, you're about to leave the business. Why don't you tell me, um, if first of all, if there's anything I can do to keep you in the business, but moreover, maybe if you can be as honest as possible, because there's nothing to lose at this point, why are you leaving? And mm-hmm. he said that he was leaving because he found that the business was disorganized. My management style was erratic. There was no vision inside of the organization, and there was no one really leading operations. And so, wow. I, and my immediate my immediate <laughs> thought was the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Forget about him. And I went away for the. This was right before the Christmas break, and I think twenty. And again, I don't remember the year twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. Went away for the Christmas break, and I sort of thought about his comments and really let them. I, I really reflected on them for a period of time, and I came to the realization that he was right that the business was disorganized, and I wasn't an operations leader, and things were very erratic. So all of the things that he said to me that needed to be done in the business, I committed to changing. And I, I, as soon as I came back from the New Year's break, we ended up hiring an operations manager, uh, I would say within two weeks. And the business, as soon as I took my eye off of operations and let a, 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 an operations leader lead the operations side of the business so I can focus on growing the business and working on the business, not in the business, that's when the business really flourished. And our, our revenues more than doubled. Our profitability, I think even more than quadrupled in probably four to five year period of time. And that's really what allowed me to bring the business to market and go to private equity and get a really good valuation on the business. So as much as I actually, I actually thanked the individual. I called him about a year ago and I sent him a little gift and I said, thank you. I'm not going to tell you his name, but I said, thank you. Because little do you realize that what you said was the kick in the can that I needed to help me understand that I'd reached my Peter principle or my Peter moment. And Mm -hmm. I needed to do something different and pivot in order to move up to the next level. And I was able to do that as a result of his comments. Yeah. And and it's also a reflection whether, you know, the comments were there or not, but it was a reflection of you as a leader that the person was open to let you know. Um, because some some folks, um, when they made the decision, they may not want to tell you anymore because you will never know why why they were leaving. And I'm just curious, how long was he or that person there for? Mm, I'm guessing maybe five years, something oh, wow. like that. Do you have a clear vision of where and how to grow your business? How does your workforce look like? As we prepare for the growing gig economy and remote workforce, it is essential to understand that you are working with a communications partner that can help you get there. Slingshot understands the growing needs of business leaders and works with them to ensure that their infrastructure is aligned to their vision and their growth plans of the future. To learn more, go to slingshotvoip.com. As soon as you came back and, you know, outside of the ops person and being erratic, what else did you do? Did you, because I know you mentioned you're part of a, a forum now, a group. Uh, is that about the same time that you were joining these peer peer groups? Were you looking oh, to get I did better? Also- Yeah. So I did a whole lot of stuff like, so, okay. You you know, the expression, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Well, so I was living, doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. And that's why my business was stagnant and stale for so many years. So until I actually took the business to the next level, I had to make a lot of changes personally and and as a leader in order to do that with the business, i.e. put a management team in. I joined a a CEO group and we got together on a frequent basis. And and I'm actually on the board of that um, group now. Uh, And and, uh, I learned a whole lot from the individuals inside of that that, um, team. I put a vision together for the business. We didn't really have one. And I don't mean a vision statement. I mean a vision, i.e., 
where are we looking to go in two years, five years? Um, we started having State of the Union meetings. We start, we, we changed the culture. We actually created a culture inside of our organization because we didn't really have one. So I, I started treating, and, and I made it a personal goal to get our business to become one of the um, top 50 employers or top 100, I don't remember the number now, top 100 employers are best places to work in Canada. And we actually won an award, I believe, in 2017 for that. So I made a whole lot of changes in and around that. That period of time, um, not just hired an operations person, but I changed how I worked. Uh, I, I read about leadership and I read different books and I, I talked to different people and I changed the way I was doing marketing and sales and everything else. Um, we put a sales manager in place. I didn't have a sales manager prior to that. I was actually the sales manager at the time. So mm -hmm. yeah, I made a lot of changes personally and inside the business. Wow. And let's talk about in terms of, I guess, after you realize this this glass ceiling you had the peter principle like did that you know emotionally did it change your outlook as well because it i i could almost imagine as soon as you get past that ceiling you re, you know you have this new lease on life in terms of the business you have this new energy you're learning again and you're open and and you and maybe maybe you don't even know which not not know which way you're going but it feels amazing again so I loved the challenge of from 2013 to 2017 or, you know, in that five year period of time, I loved it. I was re-energized. I was learning all sorts of new things. I was, I was excited about the company. And then when, when early in, the, in our conversation, I was explaining that my wife's best friend ended up getting diagnosed with cancer. And in around that time, I'd come to realize that it was now time for me to set a new goal for the business. And so my goal for the business was once again to double the organization. So let's just you know say I, I was able to double in from 2013 to 2017. I'm now sitting there saying, okay, it's 2017. What's my new goal? My new goal is to double the organization, but I don't want to do it. So I, that's why I ended up selling because the challenge was gone. The challenge of doubling again just wasn't there. So I, I learned a whole lot while I went through that process, but the excitement of building the business I, I had left. I wasn't excited. You know, the only thing that was in it at this point was financial. And to that end, that part wasn't exciting for me. So the thrill of building it had left and I needed a new personal challenge. So that, that's why I sold. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, and, and that's how I came to that decision of, yeah, reached my Peter principle, but the next step above isn't really going to to be a challenge beyond the, the growing the business and doubling it once again because I knew how to do it. Yeah, no, that, that's right. Um, you mentioned that you're writing a lot more now in this blog, and I find it fascinating, and especially with, through this conversation, it's really apparent that you have many things you could teach outside of like investing, growing wealth for entrepreneurs. Uh, there's there one blog article I just read last night, Jeff, it was about... Uh, uh, you're, it was something about the paradox, and, I, and I'm going to just try to paraphrase it because I, I just read it. Um, and it was, I think, specifically about letting go and getting out of the way, um, out of, I guess, your team members and and how you overcame that paradox personally. And, and I imagine during this growth phase, you figured that out. Can, can you talk about that? Sure. So when we put a sales manager in, I came to recognize the paradox of uh, and the paradox that most small business owners face. So most people who start a business, I'm not going to say all, but most entrepreneurs are the primary salesperson for the organization. Um, and, and that's in a, in a lot of cases. They're the company's best salesperson. And in that, in the paradox is, is that the best salesperson, if you, if you, if the leads are coming in and you know that you're the best salesperson, you're going to take the leads. It's challenging to trust other people to sell because not, you know that not everybody sells as good as the business owner. And that's not always the case. But again, going back to the comment of in many cases, the business owner is the business's best salesperson. So there's a natural inclination for the salesperson, the, the owner to keep going in sales and hang on to as many accounts as possible and kind of not give them away. But the paradox is, is if you want to build a business, you need to learn how to give everything away and how to manage a team of people so that they can replicate the things that the business owner is doing. Mm 
So um, the, the article, and I actually don't have it in front of me, I think it was the nine steps that you need to take in order to build uh, a sales team from scratch or from the ground up, I think is what the title was. And it kind of went through the process of how do you hire. Um, but it, it, the initial part of the uh, article, I talked about the paradox of being the best salesperson and needing mm -hmm. to let go of leads, but not wanting to let go, but needing to let go if you want to build the business. Yeah, and, and it's really it's really fascinating. And this this paradox, like I said, this was something that you had to come to realization as well. And and it, it was at that point where that person was leaving you, right? And when you went through that massive growth as a as a business leader and entrepreneur, um, to to get away from that paradox, to to learn that, and 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 it's really insightful at the sense that you had the wisdom to actually ask the person who is leaving, why they're leaving, because it was someone you never thought would leave, right? Absolutely. So, and, and that was the most, that was the eye-opening part. So in hindsight, was it good that he left? Well, yeah, probably because it forced me to make all sorts of changes I likely would never have made had he stayed around. So it, it, it allowed me to get past my glass ceiling and move to the next level. And I did the same thing with the sales team as I did with the, I think I mentioned this early, the operations. So, so I stopped the man, man, managing operations. I stopped managing the sales team. I managed the people that managed the teams. I didn't directly manage the teams anymore. And that allowed me to spend more time on the business and, and growing the business and not working in the business, dealing with the minutia that happens on day to day. And, and frankly, if you're running a 50 person operation, it's very difficult to be dealing with accounts payable or accounts receivable issues or, or specific customer service issues. Now, granted, the president does need to get involved from time to time, but a lot less than I was doing in 2013. And really, and most importantly, it allowed me to work directly with HR, which is probably one of the most important parts of the business, to start building out the culture of the organization. And that's when things really started to flourish. Yeah, I wanted to actually touch upon that, and, I, and I'm happy that you're segueing into to culture because culture is something that many entrepreneurs may not think of until you know they're growing and they want to have people staying. So I want I wanted to ask you, Jeff, when it came to your culture and as your company was growing, how did you share this knowledge, this vision, this culture to to folks that were getting onboarded and maybe even more importantly, the people who's been there a while? Mm -hmm. So if I think back to, again, life before 2013 and life after 2013, a light bulb went off and a lot of things changed. What also changed was my realization that I've got to grow amazing people and I've got to grow the business by growing great people. I didn't realize that prior to 2013. And that was sort of the thing that changed for me. Prior to 2013, when a new employee started, I basically did a lot of the HR onboarding. I went to the cabinet where we kept our supplies. I took paper clips, pens, um, a file folder, and some other things, put them on the new person's desk, made sure they had a phone working. And that was essentially our onboarding. And when it came time to start, you know, we just kind of let them flounder and, and a lot of people yeah. didn't do very well. And so we definitely put a whole new shape and culture inside of the organization. But the first thing that I needed to do, we had we had a State of the Union meeting. And at that mm -hmm. meeting, I, I explained to the staff that the business was turning over a new leaf and that I'd created a vision for the organization. And I explained where we were looking to go. And I actually was was fairly bold. And I said to the staff, Here's my vision. We are going to double in size in the next four years. We are going to double our revenues. We are going to quadruple our profits. And this is how we're going to do it. Here's my blueprint. This is where we're going. Who's on board? And everybody was on board and it actually went through exactly as planned. Now, as part of that process, there's a lot of things that we needed to do to formulate that culture. But inside of that was the, the first step is letting people know where you're going. Because if you don't tell them where you're going, they're all going to go in opposite directions. If I said to you, hey, Edwin, I want you to meet me at 123 Main Street in some random town. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to open up Google Maps. You're going to look at the traffic. You're going to look at the direction. You're going to figure out what the best time to leave is, and you're going to figure out how you get there. 
You're going to spend right. more time trying to navigate your way by car to some remote place than most business owners spend on coming up with the vision and the direction for their business. And that's the thing that's lacking. So even those that do have the vision and direction, don't let their staff know what the vision and that direction is. So they start heading off, but they don't get up in front of their staff and say, here is where we're going. So it's almost like saying to people, start rowing your boat. And everybody's going, where are we rowing? Just doesn't matter. Just row. Yeah, but that's not good. Where are we going? Just point me in a direction. I'm not going to tell you. Just go. And that's how most yeah. business owners are running. They're just going. They don't stop. There's nothing formulaic about their process. And they just start rowing. And no one knows where they're going other than rowing. And so people are going in opposite directions. That's the challenge. And and I'm wondering, and maybe from your experience and working with other C-level CEOs as well, when it talks about culture and vision and direction. Can this be done working in smaller divisions within bigger organizations? So let's, so let's say you're you're a director or VP of a large uh, within a large organization, can you also set that type of culture within your organization and and maybe do the same type of, you know, town halls that you're talking about? Absolutely. So I, inside, look, let, let's say now I've never run a business of a thousand people, so I can't answer that this question from experience. But what I can say is any person who rises through the ranks, any person who is a leader is going to lead their people. And even if you're the CFO or you're the CMO or whatever position you have, you're not the CEO, but you've got a senior level position, you've got 15 people reporting to you in a thousand person operation. You have to lead your people as the leader of your group or your team or the finance department. You've got to let them know what the goals are, where you're, what you're trying to achieve, how you're planning on achieving them, who's going to play what position and who's going to be doing what on the team and, and cultivating and working with your people. So they want to come to work. So they're excited about work. Those are all the things that an effective leader needs to do. So it, I would say no matter what, whether you're at the top and you're running the entire thousand person operation or you're a manager and you've got 10 people reporting to you, you still need to do the same thing. You still need to work with your people and cultivate them and train them in the exact same way. It's just at a different level. Yeah, no, 100%. I'm wondering, and I'm, I always love asking this, and it's, it's definitely related, is, you know, as you were, I guess, cultivating leadership and, and ownership as well within your company, uh, do you see any similarities or some type of characteristics, characteristics that, that you believe um, every business leader should possess? Hmm. So really the ability to communicate direction, um, I really think it comes down to good communication skills and good decision-making capabilities. So if I said, what, what trait, I mean, a, a business leader or a leader needs to needs to be passionate and empathetic and, and run their business mm -hmm. with honesty and integrity and needs commitment to the staff and the process. But if there's one thing, actually, let's say two things that I think are really important is having good communicate, good communication and decision making skills. And the other is the ability to understand risk and take appropriate risk where possible. And if you possess both of those things, you probably do really well. And, and mind you, you also have to ha have the intellectual, what do they call that? EQ, not IQ. So you've got to be intellectually aware of your surroundings and the people that you're working with and what's going on in that regard. And you may be really book smart and have a great IQ but missing some of that EQ piece and that's going to affect your business and, and how you operate in a major way. No, that's great. Well, I really appreciate um, all the insight that you're sharing today, Jeff, because you got, you have a, a ton of knowledge. appreciate that you're sharing things on your blog now. I got a, I got a fun question and it might be interesting how give, given where you are in your career now <laughs> and maybe depending on when we set this question up for, but if, if I were to ask any of your I guess your past team members, colleagues, business partners, you know, what's the best leadership quality that Jeff possesses? Let's say in 2017, <laughs> what do you think they would say? Hmm. I guess it depends on who you ask, but if you ask any of the people that I worked with in the later years, they'd probably say those things, the ability to understand risk and take appropriate risk where, where necessary and having good communication skills. And, and I, I had no problem getting up in front of a room of 50 people and talking about where we're going and the direction, how we're going to get there. So those are probably the, the skills that they would probably cite. If you'd asked people prior to 2013, they probably would have said, Jeff is really good in sales and really good in marketing because mm -hmm. I drove the sales department. 
management. I ran it. I think I told you. And I was the number one salesperson in the business prior to 2013. And I ran marketing and, and I did a really good job of marketing for many years. And then I eventually broke away from doing both of those things. So pre-2013 marketing and sales, post-2013 is probably communication. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Jeff, what else is going on? I mean, you have a fascinating career. You're semi-retired. Um, you're still advising, mentoring a lot of peers, I guess, some C-levels. But I'd, I'd love to know what else is going on, if you have any other special projects that, that you're super excited about and, and you'd love to share with us. So th there's two. There's personal life, and I'm hoping to um, – my, my wife and I just got back a couple of days ago from visiting our daughter in, in Halifax. She's at Dalhousie University. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we just got back two weeks ago from uh, Croatia and Portugal. We're going to Florida in November, so, and, and we're going to Southeast Asia in January. There's a lot of travel coming up, and that's something that I really – I wanted to do, and I wanted to do for a long time, so I'm doing that. And the other thing, too, is I don't want to be disconnected from work – uh, or from the engagement of, of being engaged and, and keeping my mind busy. So I'm building a small business now, if you will. I've got, a, I've got two blogs. They're both doing very well. Uh, I've got um, many thousands of page views on a daily basis. I'm going to start monetizing that. And those are businesses that I can run from anywhere. And I enjoy giving back and helping other entrepreneurs. So that's really, um, in a nutshell, to run a small little business on my own, do it from wherever I want. Want to help entrepreneurs and travel and see the world and sort of explore and experience life um, while I can and while I'm still young enough to actually do it. So those are the things that I'm working on now. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited to keep following and sharing the knowledge. Your book will definitely put the link to your Amazon book on this episode's page. So if you're listening and, and you want to check all that out, his blog, the, the, the book, uh, let us know. But before we end, Jeff, I'd, like, I'd love to get maybe a final thought observation. Ideally, I like to share actionable items for those who may be leading a successful business today and uh, may want to leave with an aha moment. So I, I can leave you with two thing, two actionable takeaways. Look, I can give you 20 and I write about them mm -hmm. on my blog, but I'm going to leave two actionable takeaways. The two things that I see most small business owners not doing, and there's a whole lot of them like in, in terms of profitability and not growing revenue properly or effectively. But the two things that I see happening most often is most business owners don't have a proper vision for their organization. And they don't understand KPIs and they don't have proper metrics to, to guide the organization across all divisions and all, all areas of, and all facets of the business. So that's where I see most small business owners. I would say want top one and two. I probably could list off 10, but in terms of number one, lack of vision, lack of planning, lack of leadership, and that they're all sort of one. And then the other, not having a proper understanding of the business's KPIs. And same thing with the people who were working within different teams don't understand KPIs and they're not KPI driven. So they don't understand what they're trying to measure to. So those would be two um, actionable takeaways to try and propel a business to the next level. That's amazing. Well, Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure to close. Can you share where we could find information about you your blog or anything else you'd like to share with us today? Sure. So you can find you can find my blog. It's called thekickassentrepreneur.com. Uh, and my contact information's on there. You can read all sorts of stories about how to grow revenue, how to increase profitability, how to invest. I also talk extensively about real estate, so you can read all of that on my blog. And uh, my phone number's on there as well if you want to get in touch with me as well. Well, Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us on the Business Leadership Podcast. My pleasure, Edwin. That's it, Biz Leaders. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Business Leadership Podcast. This was episode 131 with Jeff Wiener. If you want to learn more about Jeff, his book, The Kick-Ass Entrepreneur, or anything else that we discuss, please go to thebusinessleadership.com slash 131. Please join me on my private Facebook group where I will discuss this episode. I'll answer your questions and connect you with other like-minded business leaders. Simply search for the Business Leadership Group directly on Facebook. Thanks again to Slingshot, a leader in business VoIP communications, a company that understands strategic growth, which aligns with your vision and goals of the future. If you haven't done so yet, Please subscribe, rate, and leave a comment on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening today. Thank you again. Edwin signing off. Edwin.
Thank you for listening to the Business Leadership Podcast at thebusinessleadership.com. Okay.